Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. But first of all, got to give a big shout out to Alex Inkster. Alex has been supporting us over at patreon.com slash PCP for a good long while now. Alex, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. You help support this channel and provide a positive place for YouTube and comics to combine into one ultra awesome force. So thank you so much, Alex, for uh, all your support over at Patreon. So let's get right into the weekly comic book review. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Doom Patrol, Weight of the Worlds, number two. I'm just as surprised as you are, but this was the most fun I had with a comic book this week. There are some exceptional titles out this week. We'll be covering those in the next few. But Doom Patrol Weight of the Worlds, to me, was the most exhilarating, the most innovative, the most experimental, the most gut-busting, the most awe-inspiring, um, the most imaginative story on shelves today. I really like this issue. After the first issue, I liked it. I thought it was decent. But with Gerard Way inviting Jeremy Lambert in as a co-writer to help kind of even out the scheduling conflicts that led to Doom Patrol Volume 1 from DC Young Animal, it caused it to be a little bit late, especially towards the end there. So we got Lambert in as a co-writer, and I thought, well, I was a little bit afraid that it would kind of my interest would wane just a little bit. Like a little bit of Way's influence would just kind of go away. Maybe he's coming up with some ideas, but somebody else is executing them. Kind of like in Cave Carson. I thought that book was really strong and solid at first, but when Way kind of stepped away from it, I felt like it suffered and lagged a little bit. That's not the case with Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol Way to the World's number two is one of the most Doom patrol issues of this Way run of Doom Patrol yet. I loved it. It was amazing. It's got great, brilliant, innovative composition and artwork. Some really cool stuff going on there by James Harvey. Loving the art. I was really also kind of worried that Nick Darrington, who does this awesome cover, wasn't coming back to do Doom Patrol in the second volume. James Harvey is doing something completely unique, some com something completely different, but right along that same vein that Way and Darrington established in the first DC Young Animal run. I love this. It's got a great, fun story. Lots of great character moments. Robot Man is back. How is he dealing with that? What's going on with Danny Land? Some really cool throwbacks. Um, loved this issue so much. Weird, wild, wacky, fun. That's what I've come to expect out of Gerard Way's Doom Patrol, and it delivers like to the nth degree here in Doom Patrol Way to the World's number two. That's my pick of the week. What's yours? Let me know in the comments down below. Also from DC this week, Justice League 29, which serves as a prelude to the Justice Doom War coming up. Or is it the Doom Justice War? It's the Justice Doom War. So the Justice Doom War has been what Scott Snyder, James Tinian, and company have been building up to ever since Metal and onward in the pages of Justice League and the other titles. And it's coming to such an exciting head. And here it is, yet again, another Calm Before the Storm issue. But what's really cool about this issue is that it's a complete good catch-up issue. So if you haven't been reading, or if you've just kind of forgotten some of the things that have led us to the point that we're at right now, this completely catches you up on everything that's been going on post-metal in the pages of Justice League, how it's all come to this one direction, this one plan of Lex Luthor, and I'm loving it. You're the villain. This stuff's fun. This is also, what's really cool, is that the way that they structured the story, it's a jar story. So Jaro is kind of like the Justice League um, sanctioned offspring of Starro the Conqueror, and I love this character so much, what Snyder and Tinian have been doing with them. This has got some really great touching moments as well, so just for a big catch-up exposition-y issue, it's got a lot of heart, it's got a lot of action, it's got a lot of fun in it. That's the that's the word of the week. It's fun. Comic books should be fun, and they are fun this week. Justice League number 29 out this week. Speaking of the Year of the Villain, Sinestro has a Year of the Villain one-shot. It's written by Mark Russell, and if you like Mark Russell's style of writing, you definitely need to check this out, because he definitely does tackle some of the, the themes that, he's used to, that you're used to seeing him tackle in his books. Overall, though, it's an okay Sinestro story about one of his roles in this upcoming Justice League Doom, Legion of Doom War, but ultimately didn't really have any new information, no new revelations, didn't really explain anything new about the character to me. It was a decent little fun one-shot story, but didn't really have anything to do with the overall arc of everything. I get the vibe that that's what most of these Year of the Villain one-shots are going to be. Just a way to like kind of spotlight some favorite villains here and there. So if you're a big Sinestro fan, definitely pick it up. If you're a big Mark Russell fan, definitely pick it up. But if you're just kind of casual, just excited about Justice League, but don't really want to get too much outside, maybe it's skippable. 
but Mark Russell does do a great job with the script and some of the themes that he tackles. Sinestro, Year of the Villain one-shot, out this week. Speaking of Sinestro, Green Lantern number 10 is here. Sinestro's not here, but the multiversal Green Lanterns are here. So ever since Grant Morrison took over Green Lantern, this is one of those stories that we have been anticipating and waiting for anxiously. It's the green, it's a threat so big that all the different Green Lanterns from across the multiverse have to come together. So fans of Grant Morrison's work at Multiversity and Final Crisis, stuff like that, you're really going to see a lot to have a lot to sink your teeth into in this issue. You got a Batman Green Lantern from one world. You got a like a stoner, tripped out, hippie Green Lantern from another world. Lots of different Green Lanterns and one big, giant, multiversal threat. This is the kind of stuff Morrison does, and he does it well. And I love this issue. May have been one of my favorite issues of Green Lantern yet since Morrison has taken over. Liam Sharp continuing to pump out some of the absolute best work of his career. Detailed and textured with excellent composition and layouts. Green Lantern number 10 did not disappoint. And after that little fun yet slightly weak annual from last week. This is a nice breath of fresh air. A big multiversal Green Lantern Grant Morrison story with Liam Sharp on it, right? Let's talk about Deceased. Number four is out this week. Look at that cover. I'm not usually the biggest Matina fan, but that Joker cover for me is the cover of the week. That is awesome. Creepy. Super awesome. This book is fun too. Tom Taylor doing a great job with this deceased book, which is basically like Marvel Zombies meets the DC Universe, but it's got a lot more nuance. It's got a lot more drama. It's got a lot more touching, heartfelt moments inside of it. A lot more tragedy. Not so goofy, not so fun as the Marvel Zombies one. This one is tragic and just, just, just no win scenario out there, right? I really like this one. Big explosive ending. Be on the lookout for that. Deceased, number two, an Elseworlds tale, if you will. Um, Tom Taylor, uh, Trevor Hairsign and company, doing a great job. I'm loving this book. I'm having so much fun with it. Lois Lane, number two, is here from writer Greg Rucka, an artist. Is it Mike Perkins? Pretty sure. Yeah, Mike Perkins, Paul Mounts on the coloring. Um, I'm liking what Greg Rucka is doing on Lois Lane. This is going to be a 12-issue series, and it's really focusing in not on Lois Lane being the wife of Superman or anything like that, but about her job as an investigative journalist. And I absolutely love that approach. It's very realistic. It's very grounded. It's got great dialogue. It's got some Renee Montoya action in it. So really love that. And if you're a Rucka fan from the Batman days, you really want to check this one out. I love the way that Rucka writes Lois Lane. He writes her not so much like a damsel at all, not so much like a two-dimensional character either, but she definitely has a lot of 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 meat behind her there's a lot there i love the dialogue i love the approach of this book i'm having a lot of fun with it i love the noir aspect of the of the artwork i love its 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 uncanny uh, similarity to some real life political type situations greg rucka lois lane number two out this week I'm loving it. Batman number 76 is here, continuing the City of Bane story, and I'm liking it. I know a lot of people are up and down on Tom King's Batman. Even I am. Overall, I do like it, but it's got some dips in quality. City of Bane, pretty up there, though. I really do like this story so far. Tony Daniel pumping out some really uh, great artwork. It's, it's not as as gritty or as rushed feeling as some of his artwork has looked in recent years, but it's definitely crisp and clean with a heavy line behind it. Um, so, Florel, Flor, Florea, was that the inker on it? Because it's got to be the inker, right? Anyway, this is a story about Bane taking over. Oh, there's a yeah, there's a few different people on the inks there. Anyway, I really like the artwork. I really like the story. Basically, Bane has been behind all of it, <clears throat> and now he's taken over Gotham. And the U.S. government has agreed to allow him to take over Gotham as long as he keeps crime down. As long as we're not hearing any more mess out of Gotham, we're cool with it, right? So it's like the ultimate spiritual successor to Nightfall, where Bane really takes it even further. And I'm loving it. It's a slow build. This is going to be a a slow build in the City of Bane story, but I'm liking each little tiny bit of it. And like I said, Tony Daniels' artwork in this is very crisp, clean, and very defined with some heavy weight behind it. Really liked it. Speaking of Tom King, Superman Up in the Sky issue number two is here, which contains chapters three and four of those Walmart exclusive Superman stories that he did with Andy Kubert. So if you never read those or just want them in one nice comic book together without all the reprints, here it is. Um, They're all right. They're pretty decent. I like some of his ideas. This one's got a nice little boxing story that's kind of cool. And it's got another story that's good both of them are nice and they have a nice little punch and they work really well as 12 issue I mean as 12 page stories but when you put them all together like this it's kind of jarring when one goes to another it doesn't really quite flow into one another as well but I do like some of the nuances and the lyrical flow of Tom King's dialogue Superman up in the sky <clears throat> number two out this week Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 number four is out this week. James Tynion has basically been the architect of these TMNT Batman crossovers, and I've had so much fun with them. 
Um, the Volume 3 is amazing. It's taken it into a crisis level type thing. You've got characters combined. You've got like a Shredderish version of the Joker, but the Shredder's still in here as well. Crane's doing some crazy multiversal type stuff. Um, I'm loving this book. So fun. Freddie Williams' artwork is really great. It does a great job with these licensed properties like the Turtles. Also when he does He-Man, Thundercats, Injustice, stuff like that. But this is a fun story. I'm liking it. This one focuses a lot on Shredder and the Joker, and I had so much fun with it out this week let's jump over to marvel absolute carnage absolutely been looking forward to this one you know me i'm a huge venom fan i'm a huge carnage fan i'm a huge donny cates fan i'm loving what him and ryan stegman have been doing in the pages of venom they've been building up to this since day one it's finally here absolute carnage and this is a giant giant story and it's fun so it's 7.99 but it's big it's got 60 full pages of story. So it's like three comics in one. So when you really think about it, it's double priced for three comics. So I think that's a pretty good deal. Every single page is done by Ryan Stegman and it's some of the best artwork of his career. You got Mayer on the inks, you got Martin on the coloring. Really liked it. If you've been loving Venom, you're gonna love Absolute Carnage. Um, Carnage is out there now and he's after anybody who's ever worn a symbiote. And that's a whole lot of characters over at the Marvel Universe. So this is big, big fun. Um, the story hasn't really expanded outside of the world of Venom or Spider-Man yet, but you know that it's about to. Dark, big, violent, luscious colors, Really loved this book. Absolutely solid. War of the Realms, it was all right. And I'm not speaking for all the tie-ins that are going to happen out of Absolute Carnage, but the main series, at least this first issue, which is huge and a big, nice value for the dollars, um, I loved it. I thought it was great. Carnage, the way that he's uh, represented and characterized, Venom, Eddie, his, his son, Spider-Man, some great moments in this issue and just moments of absolute dire just despair and a really crazy ending that's going to just really have you wanting more. I loved Absolute Carnage. Number one out this week. Another big one from Marvel this week is House of X number two, and this book was awesome. I thought House of X number one was great. I thought Powers of Ten was amazing. House of X number two changes everything. It literally does. They've already changed everything in issue number one. Issue number two changes it even further. It really provides a lot of backstory on the character of Moira, and a lot of stuff we didn't know, a lot of new information, a lot of exciting new information. This is great. Jonathan Hickman taking over the X-Men franchise and doing his thing. Lots of great Hickman-y design type things in here. Lots of back matter. There's even a timeline in here. It's all broken out in nice graphics. You got Tom Mueller coming over to join him for the graphic design as he does over at Black Monday Murders. Oh my goodness. I'm loving this book so much. I'm so excited about the X-Men. I have not been this excited about the X-Men in forever. There's been some good runs here and there, but since Morrison left the title, I have not been this giddy with excitement and anticipation for every single issue coming out. I cannot wait for next week. House of X number two, don't let this one get spoiled for you. This one's going to blow your mind, especially if you're a longtime X-Men fan. This book was awesome. And once again, redefines everything in just a matter of a few panels. Hickman's amazing. Oh, and Pepe Larraz's artwork is fantastic as well. And Marte Gracia on the coloring, fantastic. Future Foundation returns with the new issue number one, written by Jeremy Whitley. If you liked his work over at Unstoppable Wasp, I highly recommend that you check it out. Will Robson does the artwork and it's pretty decent. Now you got Julie Power joining up with the Future Foundation. So they're out there still traveling around the multiverse, trying to find pieces of Molecule Man. Um, I love the Future Foundation. I really came to love these characters when Jonathan Hickman introduced a lot of them and the idea and concept of the Future Foundation in his Fantastic Four run. So I'm really excited to see him come back. And Bentley 23 is just as Bentley as ever, and I absolutely love it. Jeremy Whitley did a great job of capturing the voices of these characters, introducing Power Girl into it. Not Power Girl, but Julie Power into it. That would be very odd if he introduced Power Girl into this book. Dragon Man's there, but like I said, Bentley is just absolutely spot on perfect. I love this issue. thought it was really cool and very fun. If you're a hardcore Fantastic Four fan, definitely check it out. There was a little um, set up for this in the last issue of Fantastic Four. Um, I'm loving it. I thought it was really good. Agents of Atlas gets a new miniseries out, so it started with New Agents of Atlas, which was a War of the Realms tie-in. I thought it was all right. It had a decent flow to it, but then I kind of fell out of it. Didn't really feel like it had a big thing to do with the entire 
entirety of War of the Realms, but it did set this book up, so a lot of new characters um, are in here. Really fun stuff. I actually did like it. I think Greg Pak and company did a great job um, introducing the concept again, or reintroducing, I should say. Jeff Parker does a backup story in there. Nico Leone's artwork, pretty decent. Um, overall, though, I don't know if I'm really going to quite follow it. None of these characters or none of the, none of the bits of the story immediately stood out to me, but it also has some nice classic throwbacks to the I would say classic Agents of Atlas, but, you know, the ones from a few years ago. Immortal Hulk is out this week with issue number 22. I know everybody's excited when a new Immortal Hulk issue comes out. This book has been fun, kind of taking Hulk and making a very horror-filled book out of it, but still having it rooted and grounded firmly into the Marvel Universe. I'm liking it. There's a lot of build-up in this issue leading up to a big explosive moment that I can't wait till it happens, but this one's got a sense of dread about it. It's got a sense of of mystery. It's got a sense of revulsion, of evil, and I just love it. I'm loving what's going on in the pages of Immortal Hulk right now. Issue number 22 is out. You know, a lot of people are saying that this is going to wrap up at issue 25. I don't think this whole story is going to wrap up by issue 25. I think they're going to be setting up for something. Maybe a relaunch, maybe a different title, maybe leading into a big Hulk-centric event coming at some point in 2020. Because it feels like this story is so huge that it can't just wrap up without the involvement of the entire Marvel Universe, right? But maybe it will, and that could be really cool. Anyway, as of right now, I'm loving Immortal Hulk. 22 is out this week. Daredevil number 9 is out this week. Chip Zdarsky's doing a great job with this book. Um, I really do like it. At first, with the change in the artist on this story, I wasn't quite feeling it. Feeling like the, the change in the art was very jarring from Marco Cicchetto into Shwarma. I believe. So, yes, that is Lalit Kumar Shwarma, but I do like it. I've gotten into the flow of it. This entire story has been really cool. It's called No Devils, Only God. Matt has once again kind of quit being Daredevil for a while. He's really questioning um, Daredevil's place, especially in his faith. And so uh, this whole story arc has been mostly conversations, and the conversations are handled very well. And there's a conversation with Reed in here, and basically Matt just asks him, you're super smart. Is there a God? And I love that conversation. I love the resulting conversation with a different character later on. And the way that this issue ends, Matt, you done messed up again. Punisher number 14 is out this week. Matthew Rosenberg's been telling a hell of a Punisher tale. And this one really excites me because Night Thrasher's in it. So Night Thrasher, Moon Knight, basically what's going on is that Frank Castle has taken his war against Hydra and Baron Zemo, has now hit the streets of New York. Kingpin's the mayor of New York. He's kind of reluctantly allowing this to happen. Baron Zemo's reformed the Thunderbolt. So you got Fixer, you got Moonstone, you got Radioactive Man, you got others. And he's coming after Punisher with everything he's got. So the Punisher might need some help. So call in Moon Knight, Black Widow, um, Night Thrasher, and some real fun surprises in this issue. Punisher number 14, really did like it. The art though, suffering just a little bit, felt a little bit rushed, but the story is right there and I'm loving this. Can't wait to see how it wraps up. Speaking of wrapping up and Punisher, Cosmic Ghost Rider destroys Marvel History number six is here. It's the final issue. This takes the, the journey of Cosmic Ghost Rider through Marvel History into the oddies and a beyond, we should say, covering a lot of the Bendis Avengers type stuff. Um, So that's fun and that's interesting, but this story started off and had, it was very funny, it was very goofy, but it had moments of like real like nuance and real depth to it, right? Um, that's kind of started waning thin on me and it's kind of gotten silly. I feel like it went on maybe a little bit too long, but it is a nice satisfying conclusion. Ultimately, just a jokey, goofy title, right? But, you know, it's fun and they just got to keep the uh, character Cosmic Ghost Rider alive, right? There we go. Invisible Woman number two is out. I thought issue one was a nice little fun exploration about a, 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 an un, not, not an untold part of Susan Storm's life, but a, a not often um, shown part of her life, and that's her being an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Um, the artwork is great. The first issue was pretty decent. I thought it was a decent setup, but issue two was way better. I thought issue two was a lot more fluid, had a lot better flow to it. The artwork is absolutely fantastic. Great clean line work, great shading and coloring. I absolutely love the artwork and I love the story. I like the flow. Black Widow's in it. Basically what happens is one of her, one of uh, Susan's um, old spy friends um, sends a message and they need her to come back. And lots of twists and turns and lots of action and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Issue two of five issues out this week. Dead Man Logan number 10 is here. Ed Brisson has been doing a great job on Old Man Logan, Dead Man Logan books the entire time. I'm loving it so much. 
Um, Old Man Logan is back in his reality. He's got one last thing to take care of. This is action-packed. It's bleak. It's desolate. It's post-apocalyptic. It's fun. If you like Old Man Logan, if you like Wolverine, I think you're going to like this. I like this new idea about what's going on with Sabretooth in this timeline. Real fun stuff. We only got two issues left. And I feel like we've all been waiting for Old Man Logan to kind of, his time to come for a while now. And, and like, especially a 12 issue series called Dead Man Logan. And we're like, let's just get it over with, right? Now that there's only two issues left after this one, I kind of don't want this series to end. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Dead Man Logan, number 10, out this week. Let's jump over to Image Comics. They have some excitement out this week. First of all, Sea of Stars, number two. This book by Dennis Hallam and Jason Aaron, um, Stephen Green, and Rico Renzi is absolutely amazing. It's basically about a space trucker, in a way, who takes his kid on a run with them. This giant space monster comes and destroys their ship, and they get separated by who knows how many light years or realities or whatever, right? Really like this one. Having a lot of fun with it. I love the artwork. The coloring is fantastic. Great dialogue. Um, a great story that at the heart of it is about a dude who just lost his wife and is afraid that he's going to lose his son now. And I just love the, the, the humanity behind this. I love the drama. Um, I love the, 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 the dialogue. I love the narrative. I love everything about it. The artwork's great. Um, the colors are extravagant in Sea of Stars. Sea of Stars number two continues that momentum set by the first one and really delivers. And I loved it. Thought it was really, really good. Thumbs number three is out this week from Sean Lewis and Hayden Sherman. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Thumbs number three is out this week from Image Comics and Sean Lewis and Hayden Sherman. Hayden Sherman is definitely quickly becoming one of my absolute favorite comic book artists working today. He's definitely one of the most prolific and hardest working. He's got three books kind of going on all around at the same time. This, Mary Shelley, Monster Hunter, Wastes Space is still going on. Thumbs is so great. Now, they've this team has worked together on a book before called The Few. I haven't read it. It's over there. I'm so excited. Hayden Sherman's artwork is big. It's explosive. The coloring is striking. Um, the story is great. If you're a fan of video games, you should really check it out. It's basically about a group of kids, underprivileged kids, who were given access by this eccentric billionaire to they were, he was given he gave them like like uh, technology gave them devices gave them video games and all what he's trying to do is train them to be an army against the U.S. government and this story goes well beyond that it's really fun I love the artwork it's crisp um, it's gritty it's textured it's got striking colors like I said a great sense of mo movement and action. This is dynamic. It's fun. It's an intriguing story. Great characters and great character development. I cannot say enough things about Thumbs. Thumbs is thumbs up. Thumbs is amazing. Mark Miller and Matteo Scalera bring us Space Bandits number two. I thought Space Bandits number one was all right. It's pretty decent, right? Um, so issue number two really kind of kicks it up a few notches. I really liked issue number two even better than issue one. I thought issue number one was a great setup. It's kind of like Thelma and Louise in space just a little bit. It's a revenge story um, from women in prison, and I really, really liked it. I loved issue number two. It's got some great bits of humor. It's got great artwork by Scalera. I was expecting a little bit more of a cleaner style from them, but it's a little bit more textured a little bit more gritty but it still has a lot of dynamic energy behind it it's very kinetic it moves it flows it's fluid and those hits hit and those jokes hit and punch as well great script great characters great artwork space bandits 2 a great book also from image crowded number eight yes number eight the second part of the second story arc i'm loving what christopher sabella rose stein ted brandt triona farrell and company are doing with this book um it's been really really fun it's dense it's got a lot of dialogue behind it but it still flows it's got a nice brisk pace to it um even though it's a dense book and actually takes you a while to get through it it doesn't feel like it takes you a while to get through it i cannot say enough things that are nice about crowded this book is so fun great characters really exhilarating story really cool concept it's got humor it's it's got action, it's got romance, it's got drama, it's got intrigue, it's got everything you could want out of a story. If you've never read Crowded, you definitely should. It's about in the near future where you can crowdfund an assassination. So one woman gets this enormous um, bounty on her head and now she has to get this one woman to reluctantly help her through the re uh, through the uh, the guard app or whatever. I can't remember what that one's called, but it, she gets the app through a bodyguard. Um, really loving it. Love this dynamic, this odd couple dynamic that's going on. Um, Sam and Diane type stuff. Really like it. Crowded number eight out this week. Cannot say enough nice things about it. Section zero number five is here. Continuing the Tom Grummet, Carl Kiesel book that originally started back in the 2000s. I'm having a lot of fun with this 
kind of like old school vibe type thing. X-Files meets superheroes. Having a lot of fun. Glad it's back and really excited to see the prequel coming out soon. That would be really, really cool. Also from Image, Coffin Bound number one. Now, I did an advanced review for this one already. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely. Um, I like it. It's really good. It's kind of like the Grindhouse version of Sandman. It's got some great wordplay in there. It's got some great lang use of language. It's got great desolate, bleak artwork. The colors, everything about it pops and makes this really cool interesting deep weird awesome type thing that's not quite so clear but the more you read it the more it becomes clear but i love these kind of books that are not quite so easily understood when you first read it or at least the nuance of it's not there's a lot going on behind this book that hasn't been revealed yet um about the characters but i'm loving it i'll read it in the back Izzy Tyburn has promised the world that if it won't have her in it, it will have nothing of her at all. Chased by an unstoppable killer, the Earth Eater, who is just so scary and awesome, she's retreading her life, leaving nothing behind but burned rubber ash and the sun-scorched bones of those who get in her way. It's a road trip of revenge and regret in a great grindhouse world in a very elegant Sandman type way. It's weird. It's a mesh of styles and it shouldn't work, but it works and it works flawlessly. Check out my advanced review for a little bit more on that one. It's also written by Dan Waters with artwork by Danny Brad Simpson on the coloring, Aditya Bidikar on the lettering. From Dark Horse Comics, we got Berserker Unbound. This is Jeff Lemire. This is Mike Diodato Jr. This is him being like, basically, what do you want to do, Mike Diodato Jr.? He's like, I want to do Conan. I want to do Conan in modern times. That's what Berserker Unbound is basically. It is basically Conan in modern times. But it's got a lot more depth to it than that would uh, that 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 pitch would 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 lead you to believe. I absolutely loved it. Mike Diodato Jr. pumping out some great artwork, really great detailed texture type stuff, some really cool and elegant composition and coloring. Um, really loved it. It's violent. It's bloody. It's gory. It's direct. It's brutal. It's in your face. Um, but man, it's, this really hits hard. It really did like it. Jeff Lemire is just kicking it everything out of the park right now. And Mike Diodato Jr. now doing some creator-owned work. He's really putting his all into it, and it definitely shows. Berserker Unbound, if you're a fan of Conan, if you're a fan of Jeff Lemire, if you're a fan of Diodato, you definitely need to check that book out. It's great. Also from Dark Horse this week, No One Left to Fight. Number two, I loved issue number one. It kind of took the comics world by storm. Um, if you missed out on issue number one, there is a second printing of issue number one out today. So be on the lookout for that. This is written by Aubrey Citizen with art by Fico Osio and lettering by Taylor Esposito. Absolutely love this book. I love the artwork. It's dynamic, kinetic. It's got a lot of charge behind it. Beautiful colors. Look at the colors on that first page right there. I'm loving it. Fans of Dragon Ball Z, fans of like fighting games and stuff like that, you definitely need to check it out. I'm loving this book so much. This one really keeps that momentum going. It gets crazy. It introduces new characters, really interesting new characters, and starts revealing a little bit about the world, about the history of these characters, about the history of them saving the world and, and how they got to the point that they are. I loved No One Left to Fight number two. Issue one was a big surprise, and issue two just continues that momentum and makes something really dazzling, shining, bright, brash, in your face, and it just grabs you by the shirt, shakes you, and it doesn't let go. No One Left to Fight number two out this week. From Source Point Press, we have Dead End Kids number one. I really like this one. This one might be your sleeper hit of the week. I loved it. It is written by Frank Gagol with art, color, and uh, cover by Nanad... Civic Cannon? Or the, this covers with Chris Mad. Anyway, Frank Gagol has done a great job crafting the story. It's basically like Stand By Me in 1999, but because it's a story about teenagers in the 90s, I really already automatically relate to it. I was a teenager in the 90s. I graduated high school in 1999. Um, I really like the references. I really like the story. It's sad. Um, it's a drama. It's, it's a little depressing. It's a little bit of a downer at times, but it's got this it's got this relatability behind it that I absolutely just treasured and loved. And I thought it was great. The artwork is great. The lettering is great. The pace of the story, the composition, um, everything about it, I really thought was flawless. Source Point Press has been really kind of doing some great work lately. Dead End Kids number one is out this week. Not going to be many of those floating around, so get it while you can. From Aftershock Comics, it's the return of Baby Teeth. Baby Teeth number 15. So I jumped into here and it took me a minute 
to kind of remember where we were because it's been a while since this Donny Cates indie book came out about the baby Antichrist. Lots of fun, explosive type stuff in here. Lots of revelations or maybe not. Lots of excitement. I'm glad that Baby Teeth is back. Very excited to see where this story is going to go. Um, it's been gone for a while. If you haven't been reading Baby Teeth but you like Donny Cates, why not? Definitely check it out. There are a few trades out already. From IDW, we have The Island of Dr. Moreau, number one. I believe this is a two-issue adaptation of The Island of Dr. Moreau, the original H.G. Wells work, of course. This is adapted by Ted Adams and Gabriel Rodriguez. You'll know Rodriguez as the artist over at Lock and Key, so if you like his artwork, you're going to love this. It's kind of a very quick, abbreviated version of the story. It all kind of happens really fast, but the artwork is really great, and it's very striking, especially because everything's done on these double-page spreads. Great, cool layouts and composition. Um, I love the intricate, detailed artwork by Rodriguez. I actually really like it. I love the story of the island of Dr. Moreau, so... But there you go. It's not the greatest adaptation or adaption, but, you know, it's there. From Dynamite, we have the Death Defying Devil, number one. It's one of those public domain characters or something, I think. I don't know. I've never read a book with this character in it. This is written by Gail Simone, and it's all right. It's decent. It's not bad, but it wasn't something that really completely grabbed me. It made me really want to come back and check out the next issue. It's got decent artwork and some nice layouts. Um, the story is interesting. I thought it was one of the better Gail Simone stories I've read in recent years, but it just didn't really quite grab me and want, want to come back. But for Gail Simone fans out there, definitely be on the lookout for the Death Defying Devil from Dynamite this week. From Red 5 Comics, we've got The Dark Age, number one. So The Dark Age was first revealed on Free Comic Book Day. We had a little bit of a teaser uh, for one of the free comic books from Red 5 Comics. Um, it's basically a story about a world where all of a sudden all metal just, just fades away, just dusts away, right? So all technology's gone, and now the world has picked up years later. Um, I didn't really like the Free Comic Book Day issue. I thought the concept of the story was cool, but I didn't think the execution was was quite right and I feel that about the entire full first issue. It did reveal a little bit more in the full first issue and it does have a nice little twist at the end but it didn't really do anything to want to bring me back but it is out this week if you've been waiting for it. The Dark Age from Boom. We have Buffy the Vampire Slayer number seven. Um, this is like a dream issue with Willow. Um, dream issues and dream stories are something that Buffy fans are going to be familiar with. I think one of my favorite episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer is Restless, I believe is what it's called, the final episode. In season four, it's all a dream sequence from the different characters, and it's absolutely haunting and one of my favorite um, episodes of that TV series ever, which is one of my favorite TV series ever, um, and it's very prophetic. There's some prophetic stuff in here. My one thing is I feel like that they have the benefit in Buffy now. So this is a reboot, right, set today. They have the benefit of knowing where the story's going, so they changed some things, but they have the benefit of knowing where it's going. I feel like they're trying to just put too much in the bag too soon. Anyway, this was a decent issue, but like I said, all a dream sequence. From Humanoids, we've got Ignited number three. I almost didn't pick this one up because I did like the first two issues, but it was something I was like, you know, maybe I'll trade weight it or whatnot. Um, but after reading issue three, I'm glad I didn't. This is about um, a group of kids who were recently attacked at a school. There was a school shooting at their school. They're the survivors, and some of them have, have manifested superhuman abilities, right? And so now it's these kids that feel like they have no voice or their voice has been taken away from them. They now have the power to affect the change that they think needs to be affected, right? I really like it. It's written by Mark Wade and Kwanzaa Osoyefo. Probably butchered that and I'm sorry. Phil Briona's on the artwork. I like this story. Um, I think it does a great job of capturing a moment, of capturing a voice and, and, and bringing it to the comic masses, if you will. Ignited number three, great superhero work with a real, um, a real meaningful, impactful message behind it. Ignited number three, out this week. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. Absolute Carnage was a blast. House of X number two, what blew my mind. Um, Weight of the Worlds, Doom Patrol number two, blew my mind. Lots of great comic books out this week. Coffin Bound, Berserker Unbound, Thumbs, Space Bandits. What else? So No One Left to Fight, Sea of Stars, Invisible Woman, Daredevil, Batman, Lois Lane. What a fantastic comic book. Are you excited? I'm excited. Thanks for checking out the video. Please do check us out at popcultureflossers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.